Hello, hello. On today's episode of Tripod, the Tricycle Creative Podcast, I'm talking with Parker Stevenson. And Parker, he's a managing partner and chief business officer at Evolve Finance, a bookkeeping firm that specializes in helping online entrepreneurs to build a more profitable and financially stable online business. Now, for over six years, he's been advising some top coaches, course creators, influencers, and thought leaders on how to make more sound business decisions using their financial data. Before he was doing this, he worked as Adidas, and as you're going to find out, he also was a musician. So I think that squarely puts him in the category of creative business owner, probably much like yourself. Now, you may be asking yourself, I thought this was a marketing podcast. Why are we talking about something related to bookkeeping or finance? And the reason being is as your business grows, chances are you're going to need to dedicate more resources and typically resources equals money to your marketing. So you need to have a good grasp on your financial situation as a business so that you can use your resources, i.e. money, to support the ongoing marketing, promotion, and growth of your business. And I think that's where for some of you, Evolve Finance might be a great fit. So I hope you enjoy it. Sit back, relax, let's go. Listening to Tripod, a podcast produced by Tricycle Creative to help safely navigate creative business owners through the worlds of digital marketing, strategic content creation, and business growth. Host Ross Erosion is a marketing consultant, content creator, and entrepreneur who brings you helpful tips, social media updates, inspiring interviews, and his own unique perspective on how to tell your story and grow your business. So if you're interested in being a better marketer, business owner, or creator, sit back, relax, and let's get pedaling. This is not relevant to today's conversation, but I feel like I want to announce it. It's such a a life event for me. I'm trying to be gluten-free. You see how I also hedge the bet? I'm saying I'm trying to be. I'm not even fully (laughs) committing already. Have you ever tried the gluten-free diet? I have. I've tried every diet you can possibly imagine. I've had an awful digestive system since I was 19 years old. So I've gone through phases where I do gluten-free and it doesn't really make a difference for me. Um, And I will say I enjoy eating gluten more than (laughs) not eating gluten. I think I uh, I found it not to be terribly difficult. Like if you're committed to it and you think there's a benefit there, I think you'll stick to it. I think of all the diets where I'll say fad diets. I don't know enough about whatever, if one works or not of all the diets where like you cut out something, you Mm -hmm. know, I do. I kind of agree with you. I think the gluten free one is actually one of the easier ones. Like if I had to cut out cheese, I I would just say, put me in the ground. Like I just, I I don't, I couldn't do it. You know, that's my first instinct too. I was going to say like, if I have to remove cheese or dairy, I've done that too, but that's pretty hard because there's so much dairy in the American diet. You know, I think I I try to be, I just take, like many things in life, I take the, um, you know, responsible, I feel like approach, right? The ce- mm-hmm. a centrist approach to things. <laughs> I try to eat vegetables and fruit, but I'll have fried chicken and pizza and whatnot. And you just try to like balance it out. So speaking of balances, today we're going to be talking about balancing, managing, your finances. And I'm here with Parker Stevenson, co-owner of Evolved Finance. And let's start with the easy question, I hope. What is Evolved Finance? Yeah, no. So Evolve Finance, we are a bookkeeping firm for online businesses. So our clients sell courses, membership sites, group coaching programs, one-on-one coaching, influencers, some online services. Um, and, and we do the bookkeeping for businesses like 
these, these online sort of lifestyle businesses. And we've been doing it since about 2010. We have a team of bookkeepers and account managers all across the country that help our clients to get their books done on time each month. And, and a big piece for us is not just like, okay, your books are done. Now go file your taxes. Mm -hmm. Each month we're trying to give our clients the, the data and the information they need to make better decisions in their businesses. So they feel more comfortable with their money. They feel clearer on what's going on in their businesses so they can move their businesses in the direction that they want, which will hopefully be much more profitable businesses. I think there's a big thing even with, with, I think with a lot of specialties, and I'd say with digital marketing, there's a similarity there when you talked about data versus analysis, right? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to give a client data. I could give a client 10 pages of Facebook data, right? Here, here's some, there you go. Here's some, here's some numbers. <laughs> but the analysis is key, particularly when, you know, I'm working with clients who may be, you know, creative business owners who haven't done a lot of digital marketing. And I think with your business too, probably working with a lot of people who accounting and bookkeeping and numbers and finances, that's not their jam. Totally. And data analysis, I read this article a couple of years ago, like the data analysis industry as a whole has, is like one of the fastest growing industries. It's one of the like fastest growing job positions you can have in an organization is analyzing data because obviously with everything being on the internet and on our computers, there's more data and information than we know what to do with. So you're absolutely right. And this is something we see with our clients marketing all the time is it, it's yes, Having data is is good, but if you don't know what to do with that data or it's not organized in a way that's meaningful, then you're not going to get any stories from it, right? Like, um, for instance, if uh, we were to log into one of our clients' checking accounts and you just see a bunch of transactions, you know, going down this page for five pages, all the business owner is going to know from that checking account statement is how much money do I have in the bank account? But there's no story. There's no pattern to the data. But when we then take that information and we take all those transactions in the checking account, the credit card, PayPal, their, their merchant accounts, and we put that into QuickBooks and we, you know, being the experts that we are with financial information for online businesses, organize that data in a way that makes sense for their business model. Now there's a story here. Where's our money coming from? Where are the main areas of the business money's leaving? And so what I think a lot of business owners think they go, oh, I'm not a numbers person. And it's like, no, you shouldn't be a bookkeeper or you shouldn't be an accountant. But if the data is organized properly, every single one of our clients go, oh, okay, you're actually putting this in front of me in a way that makes sense. This isn't nearly as hard as I thought it would be. You go from data to analysis to insights. That's what's important. Yes. Right? And, and from insights, you get direction and instruction. Right? What do, I, what do I do? And this applies to both our industries, digital marketing and bookkeeping, finance, that kind of thing of like, all right, so what do I do with this? Where do I go next? Do you feel like your clientele is what kind of makes you very unique? I mean, it's what got me into the industry at all. I mean, I was a musician and then I worked in the sporting goods industry and it was kind of more marketing and sales and product manager. I never thought I'd get into business <laughs> and finance. I, I really didn't. Um, but my business partner, Corey, him and his wife had started this business. They'd been doing it for years. The business was successful for a small business. And um, I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. And I'm like, well, I, I have a lot of business experience. I think I could help you grow this business. And Corey was like, I think you could too, but you have to learn bookkeeping and you're going to have to like build up a client list so we can actually pay you. And so I wasn't necessarily interested in doing bookkeeping, but I was fascinated by the clients that, that him, you know, Corey and his wife had built up and just fascinated by this industry. Um, and I think what I've, I mean, I've gotten to chase my dream of being a musician. I got to work in the golf industry for the biggest golf manufacturer in the world. Two things I'm passionate about. I got burnt out on those things. I chased the dreams. I got burnt out. I've been doing the work at Evolve Finance that I've been doing for the last six years, and I can't get enough of it because seeing the impact we get to make in our clients' businesses. I mean, the people we work with are just... To regular people who said, you know what, I'm going to leverage this, you know, this thing called the internet and, and take my skill sets and things I'm good at and, and put that on the internet in a way that I can sell it and they crush it. And it's some, I've met some of the most diverse and interesting people I've ever met in my entire life and getting to serve and help these, these small business owners be successful, create jobs within their own businesses, create opportunity for other people that work with them. I mean, it's just the most fulfilling thing I've ever been able to do in my life.
It probably comes as no surprise to you that Instagram is the favorite social media platform among creative business owners. Instagram also continues to find new and interesting ways for small businesses to generate revenue, promote their products, their service, their expertise. But Instagram does have a major limitation, external links. They won't work in your captions and you can only use them in stories if you have a large follower count. Sure, they give you link in bio, but that's just one link. Problem solved with solo.to. Solo.to is one bio link for everything. When you create a solo.to account, you can showcase tons of links for your business. And if you're a creator like me, you can even embed music, videos, and podcasts right there on Instagram from your favorite platforms. Want to see solo.to in action? Head on over to Tricycle Creative's Instagram account at Hello Tricycle and click the link in our bio. Solo.to offers a free plan to get you started and you can upgrade for as little as $1 a month. Use the referral link in this episode's description and in the show notes and you can save 10% off any upgrade package within 48 hours of signing up. Solo.to. It's one bio link for everything. So pivoting, doing like a a fish style free form into like a new song. I'm not a fish fan, by the way. I don't know. I don't know if that offends you, but I just, it's, we're going to, we're going to go, we're going to hit a brand new, a bit, beep, a boop into a new topic here. Um, what are the most ex- important expenses that a creative business owner needs to be monitoring? Yeah. I mean, this is where like there's, there's some things specific to like the types of clients we work with. And then there's things that I think are just universal across pretty much any type of business that you run. I think the types of expenses that, excuse me, a lot of online business owners might think are specialized. There's like software or we have to spend more money on ads than someone else or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, you need to figure out how do you promote your business? How do you find your customers? And then how do you support those customers in the, in the amount of customers you're bringing into your business, right? So it really comes down to what are your cost of acquiring customers? So for our clients, a lot of the times it's just going to be ads. It's Facebook ads, Google ads, maybe some Pinterest ads. You know, with an online business, we have a number of clients who get organic traffic, you know, SEO, content marketing. Um, they have just big social media followings and stuff like that. Huge advantage. It cuts their costs considerably because they always have this pool of potential customers that they're not really having to pay directly for, but it's becoming increasingly important for almost all of our clients to be dabbling in some sort of paid advertising in order to get their offer in front of more people faster. So advertising is usually the biggest cost of acquisition, acquiring a new customer. So that's like huge. Like that's one of the expenses that are going to make or break our clients, especially as they get bigger and bigger. The second piece is just labor. Like who's in the business helping you take care of all the stuff happening in the business, whether it's serving the customers or whether it's working on the behind the scenes operations. A lot of the times we see businesses, especially if they're growing quickly, that the tendency is to just hire people because there's work that needs to be done and I'm stressed out. And let's just get bodies in here. And to a certain extent, yes, there, there's a certain amount of we need to get bodies in this business because we're growing and we need to take care of our customers and take care of all the things behind the scenes that need to get done. But at the same time, it, it, there is a tendency for business owners to overhire too quickly because it's easier to just hire a new person than to look at your systems and processes and figure out how do we get more efficient. That is the really the second area of our clients' businesses where that can make or break. Otherwise, there's very few other expenses in our clients' businesses that are going to make or break them. Again, if you, if you had an inventory-based business or a manufacturing business, you have some other factors that, that are going to be really important. Yeah, if, if you sell a product as opposed to a service, there's yeah. a whole amount of supply chain and things like that that I'll say complicate, but you know, they're factors, additional factors that require consideration totally. there. I think a lot of businesses would think there's got to be other stuff mm-hmm. more than that. And there is, again, there's other categories and other things we're tracking for our clients, but at the end of the day, it's team 
and it's your advertising or the way that you're acquiring customers. Yeah, in a sense, and so you're, yeah, the revenue flow, right? You got to figure out how you're bringing in the money to figure out how you're going to manage it, <laughs> right? So when you you work with a lot of clients, are you able to share or or at least identify maybe like the top three? financial mistakes that creative or online business owners make with their finances? Yeah. I mean, that's the benefit of us working in one niche, right? We work with one business model. So like we know the online space really well. And so like, there's a few things that I think no matter where you're at in your business, whether you're more established or just getting started, I think the first thing, and and for some of the listeners, I might go, well, no, duh. And for some of the other listeners, I might go, Ooh, okay. That might be the, this might be the sign that I need to do something about this. But I think keeping your business and personal finances separate, we've had large businesses come to us where the business owner just hasn't made that move. No one's told them yet like how important that is. And that's easy to do with these types of business owners because oftentimes the brand is almost intertwined yeah, exactly. with them, right? So so then the waters get further muddy when it comes you're, to the finances. You're absolutely right. And so what I would encourage everyone uh, listening is, is if you are like, okay, I still got everything kind of combined. It's okay. Like again, if your accountant hasn't told you that or your bookkeeper hasn't told you that, then how are you supposed to know? But I think it's really important to separate your business and personal financial lives. It's going to make your bookkeeping easier, your accounting easier. And also just as a business owner, you have this extra responsibility, right? You now don't just have your personal finances that you need to be monitoring, your household budget that you need to be monitoring. Now you need to make sure that your business is also financially healthy. So you, to have that clarity an insight into the two financial aspects of your life, keeping them separated is going to make it ex- like dramatically easier for you to know how to balance these two things. Um, the other thing I would say is just not sticking your head in the sand. You know, a lot of our clients are coming to us because they're tired of sticking their heads in the sand or they're tired of operating their businesses by essentially ignoring the financial side. I think as business owners, sometimes business coaches will tell us like, only work on the things you're good at or only do the things that you like. And it's like, sure, maybe one day that will be the case. But as business owners, you kind of have to get your hands dirty with some of the stuff that maybe you don't really like, at least for a little while. Now, again, I don't think anyone should be doing their own taxes or things that you should be paying a skilled professional to do. But I think at the end of the day, like if you're not a numbers person, quote, whatever that means, if you want to be successful at what you do, you have to learn a baseline. You have to get a baseline understanding or at least have a baseline understanding of who you need to bring into the business to support you and and make sure these things are being taken care of because it's your job. And I think those things actually overlap because I see this a ton in digital marketing where you know, a business owner may say, I'm not a marketer. I don't want to do the marketing or whatever. I don't know about marketing. Well, then this problem compounds because if they then say, I want to hire someone, but they themselves don't at least have a base foundation understanding of what it is they want done and even the goals that they want to achieve tied to marketing. How do you properly hire the right person? If you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know what you need, and you don't know what your goals are, how do you then actually hire the right person? And I see this so much with my clients where they'll hire someone because they're cheap Mm -hmm. or young when it comes to marketing. They're on social media, right? They get it. But oftentimes these hires don't yield results because these young people have never actually applied social in a digital marketing scheme to get to, it's kind of like, again, our earlier data and analytics. They know how to post on social media, but what they don't know is how to connect that to the business. And then what you have is you just have a rudderless ship. You as a business owner don't know, you don't know enough to know if it's working, right? The person you've hired isn't probably going to communicate to you or they may communicate you in terms that you don't understand. So you have this cloudiness when it comes to your marketing and your results. So this is where you don't have to become an expert bookkeeper. You don't have to become an expert marketer. But what you do need is to at least, I think, understand some of the foundational pieces. I always say that like, I think good entrepreneurs and good business owners are just voraciously yep. curious. And I think you have to at least understand those things on a basic level or 
understand what questions to ask. When you're an entrepreneur and you're, you're the owner of your own business, you have to be to some degree a jack of all trades, right? Especially if you're just getting started and you have no budget for anything, you have to do all the things. But as your business grows, the business owner's job is to make sure all the various departments or all the various aspects of the business fit together. So if you fundamentally don't know how finance is supposed to plug into the rest of your business, you're going to have a huge gap in, you know, this huge vulnerability in your business, just like if you're ignoring the marketing and just don't fundamentally understand how that's going to fit in. So that's where, again, I think finance is a place where people tend to uh, ignore it for as long as they can. But I can assure you that especially after, you know, when our clients come to us and, and they start to get the information they need, they go, I don't know how I ran my business without this and they will never ignore it in the future. Um, so I think that's just a, a really important thing, whether it's finance or whatever part of your business you're a little maybe afraid of or you ignore a little bit. How can you start to look at that kind of head on and make sure that it's not a vulnerability? And then the last thing I would say is, just get a damn accountant. We're not an accounting firm. We don't file taxes. But if there's anything we've seen like make entrepreneurship become a nightmare, it's have trusting the wrong yes. person to do your taxes, whether it's you doing it, your business partner, your aunt who said she knows how to do it but really doesn't know what she's doing, like whoever mm -hmm. it is. One of the costs of yeah. doing business is every year you're going to pay an accountant to file your taxes properly. And as your business gets bigger, you can hire better accountants, accounts that provide more service or, or a better experience. But at the end of the day, you should be paying someone at the end of the year who is qualified to do your taxes to actually do them for you. I think that was one of, if not the first thing I did when I decided I was going to start my business. And I remember actually going to my accountant's office for the first time, you mm -hmm. know, just to meet with them. And he's like, so where are you in the business? And this was like pre-launch. I think I had just incorporated. So I at least had my LLC mm -hmm. paperwork ready. You know, and I was like, I have my LLC paperwork. I just opened my bank account. It might've even been the same day. Like I might've gone to open the bank account and then gone to see the account. And he's like, wow, um, we usually don't get people in here this early but it was like he was saying it yeah. like a good thing he's like you know he went out to us says like we wish more people would come in <laughs> at the very beginning because i also recognize there are things that i don't know as well as other things in mm -hmm. my business legal and mm -hmm. finance right and and more specifically even taxes let's just talk about taxes right i don't know any, you know, I know, I know enough, but I do not feel confident getting back to our conversation, confident that I should be doing my tax filings for a business. Right. But I, I read up on it. I learned enough so that I felt comfortable in talking to my accountant to ask the right questions. And listen, the first time we filed our taxes, it was, I had a ton of questions. I was sitting down with him and I have learned every year. And so I'm totally with you. Like hiring an accountant to assist you or do your taxes for you and do not be afraid to ask questions, right? I think that's the other thing, right? Getting back to that like curiosity as a business owner, you need to ask questions. And if you're not satisfied with the answers, then talk to other people too. But you're right. One of the best pieces of advice, hire an accountant. And I also feel like it kind of makes you feel like you put on your big boy pants if you're just starting your business. You Maybe you create a logo and you create a website and you're like, this thing's real. <laughs> and then you hire an accountant. And that's when it's just like, look at me, you know, like it's really happening. So I think it also like hangs this thing ab above you to say, okay, I'm committed now. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I, I, there's another step. There's, I'm, go I'm, I'm stepping a little bit deeper into the water if you're just starting or thinking about just starting your business because it's like, all right, this is, I'm taking a real, I'm doing something very real and very tangible to move the business forward. Well, and one thing I like to just kind of remind business owners is that running your own business is inherently risky. There's a risk involved with this. You know, there's a risk to working for someone else. They could let you go, layoffs or whatever. But there's this idea that working for a company is going to be more stable and, and safe than running a business. 
I think in some ways, yes and no. But where I do think it's yes, the, the risks are there's more things you have to know and understand running your own business than just working for someone else because the company takes care of legal, they take care of payroll, they take care of the taxes. You know, you're, Unless you're in that department that, do, that does those things, you don't have to worry about them. And that's where, sure, maybe you can get away with doing your taxes yourself for a couple of years, but you're taking on risk. And so as business owners, it's important for us to understand that when we ignore parts of our business or we don't take certain parts of our businesses seriously, that again, you might get away with it for a little while, but how much risk are you really willing to take on just to save a couple dollars, especially as your business grows and you're actually starting to make some real money? That's the kind of stuff that I think as business owners uh, doesn't get discussed enough is how do we make sure we're not taking unnecessary risk in our businesses by again, just ignoring things that we're scared of or comfortable with or just don't want to have to deal with. I have on previous episodes, many times actually, talked about the system I use, Profit First. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know about Profit First, right? No, absolutely. Okay. Do you love it, hate it, support it, get it? What What are your thoughts on Profit First? So, you know, both my business partner and I have read the book. I've actually emailed the author back and forth. We have some mutual acquaintances in the industry, super nice guy. And I think the book overall is a huge testament to how much people are looking for a financial system that works. And if you've read the book or you're familiar with the concepts, Profit First came out of the need of the author who, you know, running multiple businesses to just get some sort of financial insight. It's essentially an envelope system where you take your income and you move it into different envelopes in in essence, but instead of envelopes, there are a bunch of different checking accounts. I think Profit First is great if you don't have any systems whatsoever. It's a great first step towards having some sort of systems in your business. That being said, the clients we work with, if they're using Profit First, they tend to move away from it once we start working together because what they're looking for from Profit First they realize it is a great general way to sort of manage the business. But once our clients work with us, because again, we specialize in their businesses, we can give them more accurate metrics. We can actually organize their data in a way that makes sense. We can answer their questions. And that's why I think a lot of people go to Profit First as their bookkeeper either kind of stinks, doesn't answer their question. They don't, they don't really have teach one. them anything. Yeah, or they just don't have one at all. So they're just looking for how do I organize this in some way. But as our businesses grow, and especially like, clients who are coming to us who have you know high six figure low seven figure businesses they're they're rarely using profit first because at that point they need more insight they need better systems and they need better data and again if their bookkeeper knows what they're doing then that data is very easy to put in front of them so that's where i think our clients when they find us they go okay cool finally someone who gets it explain this to me and show me what i need to be paying attention to and then they run with it and and, and they realize how how vital it is but again, if you don't have that and your bookkeeper doesn't really understand your your business model or you don't have a bookkeeper at all, then I think Profit First can be a really great starting place. And it's okay to outgrow things with your totally. business, right? I mean, it's it's. I think for someone to say, I'm not doing anything, but oh, I'm not going to use, let's just say, you know, I'm not going to use Profit First because it sounds like what Parker's saying is, you know... Uh, if you hire someone else, they you know they they can do the stuff for you. Well, both things can actually be true. If you don't have anything, just like Parker said, having the system that you can implement is better, absolutely better than nothing. Because I will say, Profit First does very easily give you some of those insights that we talked about. Right, the system can give you some of the insights. But to your point, as your business grows. As your needs develop, as those th- like, it is okay to outgrow a system, and and it's just like a building block. It's like you know you have to build the foundation to get to the top there. So it's it's good to hear. You know, I, I really like to hear that. You know, I I, I obviously ask about. It. I've used it for the last company's been in business. I don't know four or five years. So mm-hmm. I use it. I really like it. So do you have real quick? You know, we're just coming out of COVID. Um, mm-hmm. well, I don't know. We're, we're doing kind of. better with COVID, yes. right? <sighs> I look forward to the day where someone listens to this episode and they're like, what the heck's COVID? Like, what a dream. <laughs> um, that was definitely an uncertain time, but is there anything, any tips you would have for how creative business owners 
can kind of best financially prepare for uncertain times? So this is a perfect segue from our discussion around risk, right? Like um, how do we mitigate risk running businesses in a world that's not always predictable, right? We like no one could have predicted the last year happening. I mean, it was something that really no one alive has gone through other than I guess the few people that went through the Spanish flu, the people who are like 104 years old who maybe saw something like that. They were always so, tweeting about it. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those hundred year olds, they love to tweet. Oh, so um, trendy. But I, I think like, ri- like how do we manage risk then? Well, the way we manage risk is by having cash available, like savings, just like, You never know if you're working for a company, if you lose your job and then you have to go find another job, the way we make that less stressful and less risky is by building up a savings. And so that's where, you know, at least for our clients, we have this sort of system where we want our clients to save up three months of operating expenses in their business. Now, again, really simple concept. Yeah. Have a savings account, save up three months of my expenses. Cool. But I think what happens for a lot of entrepreneurs is they go, eh, I don't need to have that much money in there. I'm just going to make more money next month anyway, so I'll worry about it then. Well, we don't know what's going to happen next month. I think as entrepreneurs, we have to be positive. We have to have a growth mindset and expect the business to get there. But no one's growth is just bloop, just straight line up. It goes up and down. And you know, if you look at the stock market, right, it's always going up, but there's these dips and and things that happen that um, kind of turn things around temporarily and then things get back on track. And that's where our clients who had listened to us and said, okay, I'm going to save up that three months of operating expenses um, that when the pandemic hit, it gave them three months to figure out what do I do? What, how do I pivot? How do we adjust? And then for, I'd say 80%, 90% of our clients, Everyone being online and at home ended up benefiting their businesses really, you know, quite a bit. So great that our clients' businesses were positioned to take advantage of that. But March, April, and May were still stressful as all hell. And and no one knew what was going to happen. That having that cushion, that money that instead of taking out so they could go spend it on a vacation or put in the stock market and have that money lo- no longer be liquid. The money's no longer available. They had this cushion in their business so that it gives them time to react. We just need time and money gives us like that savings gives us time to figure out what do I do next? How do I get around this challenge and how do we move forward? So it's a really simple way, but again, it's a big reason why our clients don't have to use profit first. Cause once you save up that cash, you're not worried about if you have a down month and then you're like, Ooh, our checking accounts getting really low. A lot, even our most successful clients will have months where their profit dips, or maybe they take a loss that month because of just the timing of when money comes in and when money's going out. That's fine. You know, for the whole year though, the numbers look fantastic, but by having some money, and again, in the early stages of your business might not be super reasonable to have a bunch of money saved in your business. But once your business starts to get consistent and generating revenue, you're making a full-time income from it. You no longer working another job. Then this is that risk management, that extra responsibility of making sure that our business is holding on to cash to get through whatever situation might come up that we have to traverse through. It's that time in the show where I am going to ask a random question. We're not going to talk about numbers, finances, or gluten, which I guess that technically was (laughs) was very random. I'm going to pull a random card here. I got this whole stack of cards of icebreakers, and I'm I'm going to ask Parker the question, and we'll see if he answers. Ooh, this is a good one. This is a good one. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. I'm ready. I avoid one of the categories is deep and like, I don't want people to be crying on my podcast. So we're not going to do that one. Just so you know. Okay. That's fair. What are the first 30 minutes of your typical day look like? Making tea. Tea drinker, eh? Not coffee? I d- I've never, never got into coffee. I worked at a coffee shop in college and never drank coffee. <laughs> I-, I just. Is that like you see how the coffee is made? Like you see how the sausage is made so you don't eat it? Is that a similar thing? No, it smelled delicious. There was no shady like <laughs> manufacturing processes I was privy to. Um, I just, I never gravitated towards it. And I think I just have a lot of energy, but I found as I get closer to 40, a little pick me up in the mornings, pretty good. Um, and I will say like, I know a lot of people are like, what do successful business owner habits look like? I, I don't really follow it. I drink tea and I sit in front of my computer and I check my emails and I kind of like, assess I know I, I aspire ready. and I get it like to not check emails first thing in the morning, but it's a struggle. 
Yeah, and and I and I don't feel bad that I do it. I know that a lot of you know it's just more of those things like you know you read business coaches books and they're like you should be meditating or like doing whatever like first thing in the morning. That's fine, but I want to check my email. I want to check my fantasy baseball <laughs> when it's in season, and then and then I'll start to like prepare for my day and have some breakfast and stuff like that. Guys, there's a balance. There is a balance to I I, I talked about this voracious curiosity, right? There is a balance though of trying to consume everything and all when it comes to tips and advice and then just doing it yourself. You can't let perfection get in the way of production. My wife teases me because I almost always and exclusively read business books. I don't know. I'm just a mega nerd. Um, and, and I will read comic books. So it's a real like, it's a huge, like a very different scale, but a lot of business books. And, and I actually have for the last six months, I took a break because I was just like, I'm getting burned out on (sighs) advice, weirdly enough. I relate to that. You know, it's like, I got to just jump in. I have been successful throughout my career, figuring shit out and doing it my own way. And that's not to say that you don't jump without a parachute, but maybe you don't jump with like 20 parachutes, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like you don't jump with a comically large backpack on. Yeah, and I think that's something I've gone through as well. When I get into something, whether it's golf or music or whatever it is, I dive in and I want to learn everything about it. But then eventually, once you build enough of your own skills and abilities and experience and knowledge, then I, I kind of get burnt out on it too. And and I've been very lucky that we've learned so much just from working with our other clients' businesses. There's very few people in the world who I think get to see behind the scenes the full picture of as many businesses as we've seen. And we see like our business owners, like the clients we work with, they're amazing, they're successful, and they're also extremely imperfect, just like Corey (laughs) and myself are extremely imperfect. So do I feel like I have balance in my life? If I don't feel like I have balance, then I look for support and ways to find that balance between my business and my personal life and all of that. And then when things are going good, I just don't guilt myself into thinking I need to do more. If I'm content and things are running smoothly, I've learned, and again, as I get closer to 40 to just- Yeah, me too. We're we're both rapidly approaching 40, so I hear you on all that. I I totally, I totally get it. I'm, I'm, you know, still a lot of years left to work, but I think it's going to be a significant milestone when it comes to how I work. Yes. Parker, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me. Where can people find you? And, uh, or, or let me put it this way. How do you, how would you like people to find you on the interwebs? Yeah. Evolved finance.com that's e-v-o-l-v-e-d evolvedfinance.com it's the best place to go we have a workshop on our website that i if you're wanting to learn more about your finances we give away a personal budget a business forecast and budgeting tool like these spreadsheets that we have free tutorials on how to use it's something we should probably be charging money for but we don't because we feel like the the financial education in the business world is so slim pickings. We just want to be able to do something and help business owners uh, wrap their heads around this part of their business. So we have a free workshop. And then I have a podcast as well that you can check out on our, our website where I talk for about 15 to 20 minutes each week about some of these behind this business scenes, financial stuff, sometimes operations, um, business strategy stuff that I think doesn't get discussed enough um, for small business owners. And, and it's a great resource again to start to dip your toes into the world of thinking about your business from a more financial standpoint and not just from a marketing and sales standpoint. I'll, I'll drop those links in the show description. And as always, you can get them on our show notes page, tripodpodcast.com. And until next time, till I talk at you, you should know what to do by now. You got to keep pedaling. Thanks for listening to Tripod. Be sure to subscribe and rate the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. For show notes and past episodes, go to tripodpodcast.com. Connect with Tricycle Creative on social media at Hello Tricycle and learn more about how we can help you with your marketing at tricycle-creative.com.